Today marks a rare occurrence. No matter how long-winded this analysis might get, there's pretty much no way the background music is going to play out before I'm done talking, because the world god only knows the theme song to the harem comedy of the same name is eight minutes long. Now, most of the time I deliberately avoid talking about the music in OPs, partly because I don't know nearly as much about music theory as I do about film, and partly because my Japanese isn't nearly good enough to dissect the full meaning of the lyrics. But there's so much to this song in particular that I feel like I have to talk about it, at least in cliff notes format before I can dissect the OP, and the fact that it's written in English, or at least English, means that I can unpack the lyrics without the interpretation of any translators getting in the way. And there is quite a lot to unpack here. The band that plays the song is called Oratorio, The World God Only Knows, and true to that, this is an oratorio, a narrative song written for orchestra, choir, and soloists that tells a tale involving multiple characters, usually based on religious themes in some way. In the case of this song, there's a bit of a twist on those themes, but it still fits the bill. In broad strokes, this is the story of an individual coming to terms with their creator and the meaning and importance of love. When you get specific, though, the creator is a programmer and the individual is a newly minted self-aware AI. This isn't explicitly conveyed in the lyrics, but it is implicit in how the first singer's voice transitions from being digitized to organic and then is swiftly overwhelmed by a second, more forceful voice that guides it through a mantra of satisfying curiosity and setting priorities, all while the choir tells it to find its own identity. Of of course, this parallels what happens in the show, too. Kema, or God, jumps from world to virtual world, making efficient conquests in his Galge hobby, but he's pulled into the real world and forced to start pursuing real relationships. All of these end pretty much as soon as they really begin by necessity, and Kema and his target drift apart, but they come out of it better, more fulfilled people, ready to take on what life throws at them. Actually, it could very well just literally be about Kema and his story. The AI thing could just be me reading too much into it. The English is a bit tough to interpret exactly in the first place, but that's what I hear when I listen to the song. In either case, the instrumentation helps to underscore the themes of each act. The first mix is in the sound of an egg being cracked open and Spanish guitar, evoking a sense of mourning, beginnings, and birth. As the singer goes on about persevering, the music becomes more hopeful and triumphant. And when the subject matter shifts to finding love, the music dies out almost entirely, starting anew with new instrumentation. Love is presented as a new beginning. This happens again at the end of the song with electric guitar, perhaps implying the start of a new romance. But the first time it happens is when the OP kicks in, so let's get back to that. In keeping with the show's gaming theme, the lead into the movement is represented by a slow loading screen. This is a pretty simple self-explanatory image, but attention-grabbing nonetheless, and the glitchy flashes of Galge characters pique our interest as we watch. When the loading finishes, the complexity of the music and the on-screen imagery increases exponentially. Binary spills out infinitely onto the screen, and our field of view is filled with an endless web of circuitry, which we then fly down to and begin to soar across. But this isn't just an abstract representation of a digital world. Every single pathway represents a route that Kema has taken, a path to the conquest of a Galgay heroine. We navigate this Galgay possibility space, zipping past a series of icons representing potential conquests, as well as the insignia of Kema's school and Elsie's skull. Then we see some sort of glowing orb floating through the digital landscape. Since we see the same sequence of icons floating over it, we can surmise that this represents Elsie as she follows Kama's exploits. This segment isn't exactly bursting with hidden meaning, it's just a representation of Kama's world, but it does create an intriguing hook for a new viewer, and it also does that thing that I always love to see in OPs, it integrates the credits into the world. The credits are written in a heavily digitized font, a pretty obvious choice in conjunction with these kinds of visuals, and they break apart as objects fly through them on screen. Okay, I talk a lot about liking this effect in OPs, but I haven't clarified why I like it so much, because there's a lot more to this method of credit presentation than just being fun to look at. If you've gotta put credits in anyway, and you do, that's the whole purpose of an OP, then it really pays to incorporate them like this. Not only does it look cool, it provides a subtle an understated way to break the fourth wall without undermining the show's plot. And that can be a really valuable tool. When your show is just a little playful with the knowledge that it is, in fact, a TV show, that subconsciously primes viewers to give it a little slack and suspend their disbelief just a bit more. It makes the show more relatable, like it's not trying to bullshit you, at least not quite as hard. It doesn't work in everything, it would be a lot trickier to pull off in a serious drama, but a little knowing wink to the audience can go a long way toward letting them get out of their own heads and have fun with your show. 
Plus, it looks cool. Speaking of looking cool, we zoom out of the digital world into reality, where Elsie descends from the sky and bounces along to the music with an adorable smile. She makes a pose with her broom and starts sweeping up on what seems like a pretty typical character card. This shot is integral in establishing the tone of the show, which you might not expect since it's pretty innocuous and generic in itself, but then that's the point. If you've ever seen an anime before, you've probably seen this exact shot like a billion times. Almost every harem comedy uses it at least five, although it can crop up in any show with a focus on cute girls, or sometimes guys. When an OP director can't be bothered to storyboard a shot introducing a character, this is what they do instead. When you see this shot, you know pretty much exactly what to expect from there. Every other main girl is gonna strike a pose next to a credit, everyone on the internet is gonna argue over who's the cutest, you're gonna watch 12 episodes of an awkward guy accidentally seeing people bathing, and the heat death of the universe will inch inexorably closer. But the world God only knows subverts this tired cliche, although Elsie is still pretty cute as she's crowded out of the shot, and treats us to a rather biblical depiction of the heavenly host of Galge waifus. And of course, the deity that they are all worshipping is Kama, the god of conquest. So right off the bat, this OP primes you to expect a subversion of harem tropes, and if nothing else, the world god only knows certainly cuts out a lot of the harem bullshit. If you want emotional closure from your harem comedies, this one delivers like four times a season. The OP uses another pretty typical shot, the crowd fly through, but it goes by quickly, and there's extra meaning layered onto it. It's revealed that we're looking at the the world through the screen of Kama's PFP, reflecting his view of the world as just a crappy game. But the girls also pop out of the screen and become real, hinting that there's more to them than simple Galgay archetypes. At last we get a glimpse of our protagonist Kama, or at least his hand, and it's part of what might be my favorite single title card from any OP, like, ever. Not only is this a really clever and visually appealing way of presenting the name of the song that we're listening to, it also creates an implication that the song is being played as an MP3 on the PFP itself, making this one of the all too rare OPs that actually kind of explains where the music is coming from. Again, not a a big deal, but it's one less minor barrier between you and getting immersed. Absorbed in his game, Kama walks through the world more or less oblivious to everything around him, which is reflected as the world rapidly blinks between different scenes using colorful Venetian blind wipes that are weirdly reminiscent of the opening to Eden of the East. This tells us almost everything we need to know about Kama. He has a singular focus on gaming, but he still carries himself with a certain poise and confidence. He has a very real presence to him, emphasized by the intense musical breakdown that accompanies him just walking. Have I mentioned how badass this music is? As the camera pivots, we see signs in the background that poke fun at the pomp and circumstance of the whole thing. A giant billboard labels Kama the Get Girl God, displaying two of his most overused quotes. Reality is such a bad game, and... I can see the ending. He walks past a jumble of one-way and stop signs, references to bad ends and points of no return on roots and visual novels, and then after passing his house he arrives at the cross street of three dimensions and two dimensions. It's all very tongue-in-cheek, made all the funnier by being presented in the same style as a show that takes treating reality as a game way too seriously. In our last shot, Kama gracefully lifts his PFP up into the air, where it ascends like some sort of divine object. Within the screen we see a title imposed on clockwork an analog equivalent of the circuitry we saw previously, reminding us that this show ultimately is about reality viewed through the lens of a game. And then the theme song continues on for four more epic, soulful minutes, but I'll leave dissecting the rest to another day, maybe in a blog post or something, or maybe someone who actually gets music can tackle it instead. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed this look into one of my favorite OPs, not to mention one of my favorite songs. If you did, or if you see something that you think I could have done better, leave a comment below and tell me all about it. By the way, as of this month, Mother's Basement is officially powered by Patreon, in addition to the general good vibes I get from all of you watching. Awesome folks like the ones whose names you're seeing on screen right now are helping to make what I do possible. And I've got to say, I am absolutely floored by the support everyone has given me so far. Somehow you guys always manage to blow away my expectations. You're the best. If you're wondering what's coming next, that's actually being voted on by patrons as I record this, so I don't even know what it'll be yet. What I do know is that they have their pick of Amagi Brilliant Park, Beyond the Boundary, Nichi Joe, Project X Zone, and Re Cutie Honey, so look forward to seeing one of those in two weeks' time. Also in two weeks' time, if you're gonna be at MAGFest, hey, guess what? So am I. Feel free to say hi if you spot me, or just use me as a landmark in crowds. I'm pretty tall. As for next week, I'll be doing a what's-in-a-scene analysis of Welcome to the 
the NHK, and if you don't know what that series is, I highly recommend checking out my recent breakdown of the phenomenal direction in Erased. Anyway, thank you for watching, and thank you all for being rad as hell. This is Jeff Thu, Professional Shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.